Welcome to tonight's webinar. This is our July uh, Michigan State University Beekeeping Office Hours. I'm Anna Heck, and we're here with Dan Wines and Megan Milgraf. So this is an MSU Extension program. MSU Extension programs are open to everyone. Uh, so here's what we have planned for today. We're going to start with resources and staying connected. Dan is going to talk about Robin. I'm going to talk about winter hive configurations. Megan will talk about winter bees and Varroa, and we should have lots of time for answering your questions. So let's get started here. Um, if you're watching this webinar live, you can find the links in the chat box. So we'll be putting some links into the chat box there. If you're watching the webinar recording, you'll find the uh, links in the description box. Uh, so we do post our webinar recordings. Uh, we're, we're recording tonight. We plan to post it to the Michigan State University Beekeeping YouTube channel. And there you'll find our past webinars. It does take us some time to uh, get the closed captioning done and upload them to YouTube, but we plan to post the recording from tonight's webinar soon. The June Beekeeping Office Hours webinar recording is posted on YouTube. So if you missed us last month, you can find us there. Uh, uh, we always like to remind people and beekeepers that the local beekeeping clubs can be huge resources for you. They provide local information, lots of good um, connections that you can make at a local bee club. So if you haven't found a Michigan bee club, you can find them by going to our statewide organization's website, Michigan Beekeepers Association. So that's michiganbees.org. And then you click Michigan Bee Clubs and you'll see a number of different uh, clubs that meet in Michigan. Our website here at Michigan State is pollinators.msu.edu. Uh, we have upcoming events listed on our website. Uh, you can find that through the events tab of our website, through the shortened link or the QR code. Uh, we have some office hour webinars scheduled. So the next ones that we had planned were August 28th and September 18th. Those are both on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then we just added a new webinar that we're really excited about. It's on October 12th, which um, my apologies, I don't believe is on Monday, but that will be with Dr. Megan Milbrath and Dr. Peter Fowler talking about European Felbrood. So um, that's going to be a great place to bring your European Felbrood questions and get a update on uh, what we have learned or what we're looking at in terms of European Felbrood. Uh, the MSU B Pelosa event is going to be hosted this year on campus at the MSU Horticulture Gardens. It will be on Sunday, August 13th from 1 to 4 p.m. So feel free to join us there. It's an event that celebrates all pollinators and is for all ages. And then we also have, up, um, we're making plans for our fall conference for the Michigan Beekeepers Association. That will be held Saturday, October 21st in Clare, Michigan. Dr. Katie Lee from the University of Minnesota is the keynote presenter, and she's going to be talking about long live the queen question mark so um looking at the different dynamics of whether or not it makes economic sense to requeen colonies she will also be doing a pre-conference webinar so we'll be publicizing these webinars shortly or soon um but we, you'll be able to join some pre-conference webinars leading up to the full day in-person conference on saturday october 21st uh, if you're not already signed up for our news digest you can sign up by going to our website and clicking stay connected and then clicking pollinators and pollination. This is our best way to keep in touch with you if we have upcoming events or news articles to share. All right, for tonight's webinar, we would love for you to please ask your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, that should be in the Zoom control panel. You can put a question in there and we'll try to get to it at the end of the webinar. You can also, uh, if you're not watching live or in between webinars, use the ask extension form on our website to ask beekeeping questions. So you can go to pollinators.msu.edu slash questions, and there you'll find a form um, for ask extension. You can write your question, and then it's also really helpful if you include photos too. So next, Dan is going to talk about Robin. Dan, take it away. Yeah, so we're, um, you know, this is again with all, with all these kind of monthly uh, office hours, Q and A. We we try to be very you know, seasonally appropriate topics, or or in, you know trying to be a little early, looking forward to what's coming up between you know either current or between now and kind of the next um, 
monthly session. And one of the things that we'd anticipate seeing in the, the near future, um, it's pretty seasonably uh, reliable year to year, is robbing. And what if you're if you're new to bees or you've not seen this, what what robbing is, is it's what beekeepers call when essentially one colony of honeybees, when foragers are picking on another colony, they're going in and literally robbing or stealing food from another colony. Um, so like this, this photo on the left, you see all the cracks in those boxes, the lids, the entrances. That colony um, on the, the left side of the pal there is just getting swarmed by, this is in a commercial yard where there's dozens of colonies in this yard. You can't see those, but the, you know you imagine a dozen or more of these pallets sitting in one location and all of those colonies and possibly colonies from a mile away or more are trying to steal honey from this colony. So they're, they're probing for any entrance, anywhere they can smell nectar, honey coming from. So little cracks, even if they can't get in them, they're trying, they're, they're testing kind of the defenses of this colony. And usually a big colony can defend itself pretty well, um, but it's it's smaller colonies that struggle. And so for, from the from the attackers, from the robber's point of view, you know, a forager that's, you know, would have to go out and visit dozens of flowers versus going and, and getting to, dozens of flowers to get a crop full of nectar. You know, they can go our, you know, and get in a concentrated form. Um, you know, if they can go steal honey from another colony. But we we typically the reason this is is a seasonal concern, I guess, is we typically don't see it when there's a good nectar flow on. It's not something I really am too concerned about most of the time. Um, in the spring and even early summer, um, and this is going to be completely localized when you see it, but in, in Michigan, a lot of locations have um, a, a summer dearth, um, and, and so dearth is when there's a period when there's not, when, when the resources on the landscape, what the, the food the environment is providing or is available, that gets scarce. Um, so most places in Michigan, most beekeepers I talk to, it's been a pretty good year as far as nectar flows. There's been a lot available right from April on forward. It started to get dry and then we got enough rain. And there's been pretty consistent food, but we're we're getting into that period where we just know, again, location dependent, but um, a lot of the, the spring and early summer stuff is kind of finished or is, is tapering off. There's certainly still some clover out there and purple loosestrife if you've got that in the area. Um, there's some other things, but in a lot of places, there's this gap before the, the late summer fall, primarily goldenrod and, and um, would, would come on. And so we anticipate this lack of food on the landscape. We've got these big, strong colonies. They've still got their kind of maximum populations. They're on that summer population plateau. And they've got lots of foragers. And they've been used to getting nectar. And as soon as that nectar gets scarce on the landscape, they're going to go looking for food. And the easiest place to find it, if they can't get it in flowers, is going to be another hive. So whether it's in the yard or it's a yard half a mile or a mile or whatever away, um, so that's that's what robbing is. Um, you see this probing all the entrances and the close up picture there you see right at the entrance bees actually bees fighting with bees you see some of them are kind of paired up here they're tussling it's the defenders are trying to kick out the invaders. Um, quite often yellow jackets kind of their populations build late summer too so they kind of get on in on the act as well. Um, often they're more interested in the protein than the carbohydrates from the hive but it's the same idea of a colony try it's kind of under siege by other insects. So. Thinking about, you know, we can somewhat predict the seasonality of this, but really prevention or or minimizing it is is as beekeepers, you know, it's, it's best practice. And so several ways you can do that. Um, and this first one kind of applies to any time you're in your hives, but it, just having having a plan, you know, knowing knowing what you're going to be doing, having kind of objectives, having all your equipment kind of, you know, that you anticipate you may need. Um, ready to go. You don't want to get a hive opened up and then figure out you got to go to the garage or the barn or whatever it is. And you, you want to just have a mindset of working quickly and efficiently, accomplish what you need to do, whether that's a that's a queen check or that's seeing um, if they need to, you need to add supers or you're going to possibly harvest some honey, whatever it is, just kind of, it, it's not the time of year to be kind of dawdling around and just poking around without a plan. You can get away with that a little more in the spring, um, but as we get into the late summer, that can, you can really get a robbing frenzy open. If you have a hive open for an extended period of time unnecessarily, or just in the course of if you've got a handful of hives in the yard and you're going to be working through them sequentially, um, you know, you want to be mindful of efficiency. Um, something you can do to help 
um, minimize it, the, the exposed honey and the ability for colonies to gain access is if you have some extra lids, like an extra telescoping lid or two is really nice. Because if you're removing supers to go down and look in the brood nest, you can stack those supers and then you can put a lid underneath it and on top and then it, it's sealed. You know, those, those bees from the hive, that are in the, they're not going to suffocate in a few minutes you're in there, but it's going to keep the robbers from like having full access to an open top, you know, top bars of honey and a, a full box that it's, you know, could get them excited and get things going. Um, so extra equipment to cover things could be a burlap sack or an old bed sheet or something like that, but just kind of minimizing the exposed surface area of the colony you're working in. Um, again, work just quickly and efficiently, have a plan. Find out what you need to find out. Make take whatever management actions you need to take, and and move on. Um, minimizing any um, spilled syrup or honey. You know, this time you're probably honey if you're if you're cracking boxes. And there's a lot of sticky in between them. If you're harvesting that, that's great. It goes in you know in the vehicle, or you know you're carrying that into a, a B type building, garage, or whatever it is. Um, but getting that out of the yard, and not leaving a lot of loose honey around. Um, you know, as we get later in the year and we're thinking about maybe food fall feeding, we want to minimize any any spilled syrup or anything because it's just going to get it's going to get colonies in that yard excited. They start, you know, maybe they clean up all the spilled syrup, but now they're in this sort of elevated energy state and they're going to start probing around the other hives and see if there's any weak ones that they can get into. So just the general um, cleanliness, particularly when it comes to this kind of honey and syrup and things like that. And then also. Um, Considering the time of day, if you're really concerned about it, um, doing your hive work late in the day, like if you know, say, hey, I've got half an hour of work to do in the bee yard, doing that kind of, you know, this time of year, I kind of, you know, bee work wraps up and, eh, maybe eight o'clock or thereabouts, um, depending on, you know, light and temperature. But I would go and kind of use that last, last half hour or whatever time frame I needed in the day, because if I do happen to get them stirred up and, and robbing, sunset's going to bring that to an end. If I get them stirred up at nine in the morning and robbing, um, it's really difficult to stop it once it's started. But a sunset will uh, will put an end to the flight and the robbing. So using, you know, just kind of thinking about that as you plan out your bee work in the upcoming. And say, I haven't seen robbing yet, but it's one of those any day now. Um, say, if the nectar dries up, that that could start happening. Um, so a couple pieces of equipment that you can use to kind of minimize or sort of, this is a, you know, I guess preventative um, for a couple of them. There is this device on the left, it's called the robbing screen. And so it goes over the entrance, uh, you know, we've got a full wide open bottom entrance there. And then it's, um, it's got, you see at the bottom, there's like a half width with some holes in it. The bees can still come and go through there, but they're very small holes. So like the, the defenders from inside the hive have a very small space to defend. You're, you're limiting the points of entry for potential invaders. Um, the, the part up above with the, uh, the hardware cloth up in that kind of wood frame, that allows for ventilation. Bees can hang out there. The one thing we want to be careful about when we're obstructing the entrance like this is this is happening in you know some of our hottest days of the year in August and early September. We don't want to close down the entrance too small where we risk the ventilation, um, you know, ventilation capabilities of that hive. So if you had you know auger holes or something like that in your colonies, putting hardware cloth over them um, is a good you you could stop bee traffic, but you're still going to allow a colony to ventilate and and, and um, limit the risk of that overheating. Um, another simple thing like the, the entrance reducer on the on the top right hand side there. You know most of the commercially available ones have a couple different settings. There's kind of like a four or five inch, and then there's like a one inch. If it's a really small colony, you're not, you know, the, the overheating aspect is, is less of a concern. Um, you know, an entrance reducer is a good option. And right there with that smallest, you see those bees kind of on the left side of it. That's closed down. You know, they're defending a space that's about two bees wide. So some traffic can still come and go, but they're not just going to get overwhelmed and, you know, where they're having to defend a, you know, a 16 inch wide entrance or something like that. So that can be something to, to think about. And then just in the bottom right, um, you know, Again, we're trying to create a mechanical barrier. If, if you're out there and get robbing stirred up and you don't have an entrance reducer, you don't have something, truck, a handful of grass, vegetation, whatever it is. And on that one, I you know, blocked off 90% and left you know, about an inch at the, the far right hand corner there again. So you're just, you're minimizing that space they have to defend. So that's how you can kind of, um, you know, physically limit robbing. Um, just the, these next couple of slides are um, kind of, 
um, more uh, after the fact to understand, you know, we get calls, be beekeepers say, oh, my hive died, it got robbed. And it, there, there's some, some kind of detective work to figure out, you know, did your hive die because it got robbed? And, and if, if that was the case, then it was probably weak from some other, you know, health reason that why it wasn't strong enough to defend itself. Or um, after a colony dies, it will also get robbed out. The end result is the same thing where you're going to go and be like, oh, there's no honey here. It must have got robbed. Well, one, the honey, the food is taken before death. The other is after. And so if a colony got robbed, you'll often see like on the left here where the um, the cappings are, they have a real ragged appearance. Um, you know, and, and that's because these these attacking, these robbing bees are coming in and it is just, it's a feeding frenzy. They're ripping off the cappings, gorging on honey and taking off. So it has this very kind of unkempt look. It's like, oh, something, you know, something dramatic happened here. Um, so if you see those torn cappings like that, where it's really jagged and rugged, that that kind of tells you it was robbed versus on the, the right hand side. This is more, you know, that frame also doesn't have any food in it, but that colony, that's that's an indication of starvation where you have some brood, um, you know, ultimately they starve. You've got bees with heads down in cells. Again, I think I'm not thinking this is like a winter kill starvation time of year. You know, robbing is kind of a summer and, and fall most commonly sort of issue. Um you know that colony also has no food in it but in this case the no food happened before death and that's why they died versus a colony on the left a colony that died and then was subsequently robbed out um and then so that's kind of in the, the reading the comb in a necropsy sort of way um the next frame or the next uh slide shows a similar idea with the bottom boards um so as we had that photo on the left before of the comb that was kind of robbed and ragged looking what you're going to see on the bottom board in that case is these wax flakes where again they've just like basically the robbers have chewed off the cappings those cappings fall down to the floor but but what we also see here is there's very few dead bees and so that colony got robbed and maybe that was the the last bees to come to that but that colony got robbed because there wasn't enough it wasn't healthy for some other reason there wasn't enough bees to defend it we see you know a few dozen bees on the bottom board but that compared to on the right, we have this full bottom board full of thousands and thousands of bees. They all died at once. That colony starved. And they just, um, you know, again, if you come along and see, well, there's no honey here. They got robbed out. Well, no, actually that one, again, they ran out of food on their own and starved versus the one on the left, um, you know, just kind of got pushed over the edge by robbing, but it was already uh, struggling. Great. Thank you. All right. So next, I'm going to talk about winter hive configurations. Um, so a lot of what we're thinking about right now is the boxes that we're leaving our bees with for winter. And so those are normally what we call the brood boxes. And then we're extracting surplus honey. So we consider the crop to be anything in the honey supers. And we consider the animal or the overwintering configuration to be anything that we leave year round that's primarily for brood and then the honey that they'll consume over the winter. So I know sometimes new beekeepers hear things like they just want to leave all the honey for the bees for the winter. Uh, but in Michigan, we can be really lucky with a good honey flow. And sometimes we don't want to um, leave extra honey on the hive because it gets extra tall and then beekeepers don't know what to do with all the surplus honey in the spring. And it can be a lot easier to extract it in the fall than in the spring. Um, if you try to extract overwintered honey in the spring, you risk that it's crystallized and it can be pretty hard to um, liquefy and heat up honey when it's in the comb before extraction. You can also risk that maybe a mouse or something moves into your hive over the winter, in which case you wouldn't want to try to eat that over, um, eat that extracted honey. So what we're doing right now is we're kind of designating which boxes we're leaving for the bees kind of year round. Those normally on campus, we're using two deeps or sometimes three deeps for that. Um, there's different wintering configurations. You can absolutely just use mediums, but you want to kind of know which boxes are intended for the brood nest and for the honey for the winter, and then make a plan to extract surplus honey. And honey extraction can be a lot of fun. Uh, if you have a if you haven't done it before and don't have the materials, sometimes someone in your beekeeping club will share, or sometimes clubs actually have an extractor to lend or rent out. Um, another so thing that we're thinking about in terms of just kind of getting our colonies to the right size in place for winter is 
um, whether or not we have really small colonies, and if so, combining them. So here's an example where we use newspaper to combine two smaller colonies. Um, we can do this if we have two small air colonies. We can do it if we have, uh, for example, a queenless colony on the top and the white, and then a queen right colony down below. But the way you do a newspaper combination is you just take a single sheet of newspaper. I make a couple of tears in it to get the bee started, although it probably doesn't matter at all. And then um, you put the bee box on top and the bees will um, clean out the newspaper, but having the newspaper there lets them get used to each other's scents to kind of reduce some of the fighting they may do. Um, this Another thing that's kind of important here is that the top box has an upper entrance. We're coming into some really hot temperatures and bees can overheat if they don't have an entrance. So um, this box that's above the newspaper needs an upper entrance in order to um, still move some air and deal with really hot temperatures. And we do newspaper combinations all the time. They're pretty common. It's not unusual to have queen issues or to have small colonies, um, but really we're just trying to get everything to a normal colony strains before winter and make sure that they have lots of honey. So here's an example kind of right after we did the newspaper combination where you can see that um, the bees have started cleaning out the newspaper. Uh, the bees do prefer the comic section, so that part's really important. And then you can see here the bees cleared out everything in between the boxes and they just left a ring of newspaper around the edges. They clean it out. Um, and as we're kind of, I know it's, it doesn't feel like we're, we're getting close to winter at all with the temperatures, um, but as we're just kind of preparing for it, some things that we're thinking about, uh, bees can be pretty slow or reluctant to drop home at this point. So if your um, bees have been drawing home, don't be surprised if they slow down. Depends on the colony and the nectar flow and their strength, they may still draw some comb. Uh, but if you have like one bo deep box of bees and then you put another deep box of foundation on this time of year, you wouldn't really expect them to be able to, to draw it all out. So expect that your bees are drawing less comb and keep that in mind when you're rearranging frames. Um, if you've moved frames around because you combined hives or colonies or because you've been doing some manipulations, uh, consider that. What we're trying to do is follow the bees' leads. So the bees normally are making their brood nests in the um, middle, on the middle frames, and kind of on the bottom box and into that um, those upper boxes as well. But it should be kind of spherical, that brood nest. And then they normally put pollen around the brood nest and then honey. So what we should expect to see is honey on the outside frames of the boxes and then honey in the boxes above the brood nest. Um, if you are finding the, you know, as we, the season progresses, they're still not drawing out comb and you just have left the foundation, you can move that foundation away from where you expect them to use it. When bees cluster in the winter, they typically start lower in the colony and then consume honey to make their way up. So you wouldn't want them to run into a bunch of foundation as they're consuming honey for winter. Um, this is not the time of year to do reversals. Uh, if you're trying to reverse the boxes, that can be difficult on our bees because it breaks up the brood nest and it also may move honey um, away from the top of the hive, which is where we want it. All right, and with that, I'll turn it over to Megan for winter bees and Varroa. All right, thanks, Anna. And of course, we can't talk without talking about Varroa. Um, and this is one of the most important times um, for bees in order for them to get through winter. And one of the things we were talking about for one of our planning meetings earlier today was um, whether or not we should have someone talk about winterizing at our fall conference, which is end of October. And we all kind of decided that it would be really frustrating for everybody because honestly, the winterizing happens right now. And so, as you see in the title of this slide, there's really only two things that are important to get through winter and really one thing, which is energy. And that energy comes from two places. So one is from honey, as you can see here, and that seems really obvious. But the other place that bees have energy in the hive is in winter bees. Um, and so you can see a photo of a cluster of winter bees. And on the next slide, it'll talk more. Um, and this, I mean, this is really the only two things that you want to pay attention to. And they will be born soon. We don't know exactly the triggers and exactly the date. We're actually working on, or I'm on a national project to look into um, mapping and trying to understand exactly when winter bees 
are formed, but it's effectively the last generation of bees um, that are born. So these are bees that are going to be born soon as pollen shuts down and as temperatures change. And then these bees are not going to raise another generation. And so all of the energy that would normally go into royal jelly production and using their hyperpharyngeal glands to create brood food will all be stored within their bodies. And so this actually makes them different and they are a cast of bees. Um, so a lot of times we talk about um, bees having three casts and you know they'll say it's a queen, a drone, and a worker. And that's not entirely true because the drones and the workers are different sexes. So a cast defined as a physically distinct individual a group of individuals specialized to perform certain functions in the colonies and bees that live through winter, they are both physiologically and behavioral different from summer bees. So I mentioned how they're behaviorally different, you know, where we talk about worker summer bees or summer worker bees are going to be bees that they're born, they are nurse bees, they're house bees or guard bees or undertaker bees or whatever, and then at the end of their lives are foragers. And that is a perfectly lovely way for a summer worker to be. A winter worker is going to be um, having almost a reverse life cycle where she's going to be doing all of this housework, really thermodynamic work, keeping the colony warm in the winter or, or the cluster warm. And then at the end of her life, she's going to be a nurse bee. So her biology and her life cycle is totally different. And then her body's different too, which we'll see with the next click. So these are abdomens, and this is one of my favorite photos ever. These are abdomens of two workers. So on the left is a summer worker, and on the right is a winter worker. And you can see that the fat bodies are the, that big white thing. And that's kind of this, it's kind of like an organ, but it's, um, you can see it's, it's spread out all through the, um, abdomen, but that is a huge source of energy. So we're asking bees to make it through the winter. And during that winter, they have to produce their own source of heat. And then in the springtime, they have to draw from their bodies an incredibly enormous amount of proteins and fats in order to um, provide food for that first generation. And if you don't have winter bees with these big, gorgeous, delicious looking fat bodies in their abdomens, your bees do not survive the whole winter and come out strong in the spring. That's literally the only thing. The reason this leads into a conversation about Varroa is that Varroa love to feed on their fat bodies. And so there's not a situation in which you have high levels of Varroa and you have a healthy generation of winter bees with these essential fat bodies that allow you to survive the whole winter. And this is the thing that really gets people. And this is why this conversation has to have now or happen now is because you need to make sure that the varroa populations never take off. We're in South Central Michigan and generally the varroa populations will start to take off over the next month if they're not managed. So if you're not doing things to manage varroa mites, they're going, you're going to start to see more and more Varroa in the colony. And that's going to coincide right when this special generation of winter bees is getting born. And you're going to have that generation be having a lot of parasites. And then that generation is going to have these damaged fat bodies. So here's some resources. We keep a page called um, keepbeesalive.org, um, which just has lots of managing Varroa resources. Um, and then in terms of what we're doing, so there is a question in the chat about what treatment options are for hot weather. And it is a little hard this time of year, but the beautiful thing about Michigan is that, you know, we have hot weather in spurts. So one option is to just wait until this bit is over. So for example, for us in Lansing, if you look at the 10 day forecast, it's supposed to be hot basically through Monday. And then so our plan is to go out with formic acid treatments after Monday and put them on. Um, formic acid is the one that is probably the most recommended to be used right now, just because this is a time of year that the colonies generally have a lot of capping or bees under the capping and capped brood. And that's the only one that's labeled to use when honey supers are on and the bees 
are having lots of cat fruit, which is kind of the main situation most people will find themselves in. Um, the formic acid does have a limit. So this is formic pro of 85 degrees, but that's most important in the first couple of days. You know, so even though it's a 14 day treatment, if you put it on and after day seven, it gets, you know, bumps up to, to 85, then um, that would be your option. If, um, I think that's kind of the only one that you can do when there's lots of brood. There are option hop guard you can also do while honey supers are on. Um, and that one, you can damage the brood a little bit. That one I don't believe has an upper limit for the temperature on that, though it is difficult to use in high temperature because it is a really, really sticky one. But that would be a recommendation for colonies that are smaller um, because the, the formic acid has less than, um, it has a minimum limit of six frames of bees, I believe. And then the once you start taking honey off, you're going to have more options. Um, and especially that will give you the option of thymol. Um, so we often use Apigard, which is like the gel version of thymol. There's also a little um, Apolife Var, which is like a little biscuit version of it. Um, but those you can do once you take the honey off. And then um, you can use oxalic acid once the colony is broodless. So, so those are kind of the options right now. Great. Thanks, Megan. All right. So all of the treatment options that are available to you are in the Tools for Varroa Management Guide, and that is a free PDF that you can find from the Honey Bee Health Coalition. And we're doing lots of monitoring right now still, so uh, using the alcohol wash test or powdered sugar roll test to monitor. Uh, we have lots of videos on how to do those tests. Do you want to tell them, Megan, about your other cool way to look for mites? Yeah, I do have a video of it. We'll maybe put it in the next one. Um, but when I was in Sweden, Anna's laughing because I'm so excited about it and I've showed it like 15 people today. No, because I would say about it. <laughs> so when I was in Sweden, they did all of their mite washes with a stand mixer. Um, so instead of doing it in the field, what we do is, because we're doing so many, because we are doing research on different varroa sides, so we're doing many, many mite checks. And this is the fastest way that I've found. But um, we collect the bees in the field. We just collect them into a, a type of baggie, basically. We write the name on it. We use the nitrogen immediately on dry ice, but you could just put them in a regular freezer. And then um, we use just a stand mixer. So I have like this one that I got off of Facebook Marketplace for $30 and we just put a little bit of Dawn dish soap and the bees and water and you run the stand mixer, like the kind that has the beaters on it for making cookie dough. And it just washes the bees really fast and then we run it through a sieve. Um, so we have two le levels, one layer that's big enough for the mites to fall through but holds the bees and then the next one that catches the mites and you just run it under a sprayer under the sink. And it's very, very fast and it's nice because you don't have to stand there and shake, you know, a hundred different little jars over and over. So I'll post a video next time. All right, thanks. All right, uh, after you close the Zoom window, you should see a program evaluation survey. It should also be sent in the email that goes out tomorrow. All right, uh, thanks to different programs and projects that support our work. And now we are ready to answer your questions. Awesome. Okay, so we've had a couple come in through the Q&A. Um, so the very first one um, is about someone who's trying to, um, having a lot of trouble with comb building from one frame to the next, and they leveled the hive but can't figure out what else to do. And they're using foundationless frames, so they're just cross wired. And I don't know if you can allow me to share screen or not, or if I can share screen. Um, yeah, I think you should oh, be yeah. able to. I should be able to. Okay, I'm gonna show you, so I looked up a photo of this, but this is what we see a lot is when people are using um, foundationless comb, and especially when you're starting out, is that you get the bees just going all over when they're not constrained. Um, what I would recommend is ignoring it for this year, 
um, because it will be really, really, really hard to remove. And as Dan mentioned, the bees are really slow, or Anna, both, I think, that the bees are really slowing down with making foundation at this time, or drawing comb at this time of year. And so, but next year, if you do want to do foundationless, it would be to transition to foundationless. So foundation is very, very useful in that it prevents that situation. But here you can see example of a foundationless frame, but it's in between two frames of already drawn comb. So I would use foundation to get started. And then I would, if you wanted to transition to foundationless, you can do it that way. I wouldn't worry about trying to do it um, right away. All right. And I think that made me stop sharing. Um, Dan, there's a question. It says, with all this rain, would we not be seeing a dearth? Do you maybe want to talk about the diversity in dearths and weather? Yeah. Um, so certainly the, the rain, the rain could help prolong some of these summer things. Again, I'm, I'm driving around the last few days looking still a lot of flowers on the landscape. I'm still seeing nectar shake in the colonies. Um, so with, with the good moisture that we've got in a lot of places, it may, um, reduce the duration or the severity of the dearth. Um, but it's, it's going to be very location dependent just based on the floral resources. I, I, we have yards that seem to produce fairly well throughout and it's, it's a minimal dearthy period. Um, and then we have other yards 10, 15 miles away where, you know, the nectar flow ends about now. And we don't really get the late summer or the fall flowage. And it's just, it's been three years we've had bees there and I kind of know. And so it's, we've had a wet year, we've had a dry year. It just doesn't really produce after a certain time of year, at least um, it, in experience so far. So I think that is going to be very location dependent, but good moisture could minimize that. Um, so yeah, good, good question. Location dependent, like most things in, in bees. All right. And then um, there is another question, Dan, I guess, if you want to do about feeding, should I feed one to one when I pull supers next week? Or they said lighter one to 0. 0.5 to help build or one to five to help build winter bees. Yeah. So, so for me, fall, fall feeding, I, I guess the fall feeding of syrup, I'm not really looking at that to build the winter bees as much as I'm looking to put on the the weight the colony needs for the winter. Um, in usually in, in the fall, it's given primary objective is to get weight on the colony. Um, I'm typically feeding heavier syrup, um, but I'm not going to look at, you know, typically fall feeding for me is post goldenrod usually um, at, you know, some point in mid September, late September. Um, so ne next week feels a little early to me. Again, it's it's location dependent. If you're going to take all your supers and they're not getting it from the environment and you want to start feeding, um, again, given if if your location, the environment's not going to provide it for the next few months, they are going to consume food. So feeding's not a not a bad thing if they're not getting it from the landscape. Um, but I tend to feed later in the year. I tend to feed the heavier syrup because I'm, I'm wanting them to store it away. So I would go heavier. All right. And then there's a couple of questions about um, wet supers. So I'm going to give these to Anna first and then we can talk. This is definitely something that there's options for. Um, so Chris asks, if I remove honey supers and spin out the honey, should I put them back on the hive or leave them off? Yeah, so it, it depends on kind of the amount of space your bees have and how what you expect in terms of upcoming nectar flows. So I'll kind of share for us, for example, we, so Dan and I have been extracting honey and then we are giving the extractor supers back to the bees because we're still anticipating some nectar coming in, but we're not giving them the same amount. So um, some of our honey, some of our hives had, for example, like four honey supers on. I don't think that they're going to fill up four honey supers again. So we might leave just one or two supers on them for now um, to see, you know, within the rest of July and August, um, if they bring in some more nectar. And then, um, our dear friend, Lori asked, we started extracting honey, which is very early for us in the UP, but usually we put the extracting equipment out when we're done and the bees clean everything up. But this year they've shown no interest whatsoever. Is it because there is so much nectar available? I mean, my guess, yeah. 
Yeah, same. Great, great, to have, great problem to have. Yep, and we we usually, um, you know, and, and when you extract, just depends. Um, if you're doing a mid year extraction like we are, is very different. Um, all right. How about this one for you too, Anna? If there are three or more supers on the hive, will that reduce the effectiveness of Formic Pro? It. I was just reading the label or the FAQs on their website yesterday, and they say that having extra boxes does not decrease the efficacy. And that is a, a really nice resource. So not only is the label have a lot, the label has lots of information. The Honeybee Health Coalition's Tools for Varroa Management Guide has lots of information. But in addition, the manufacturer that makes Formic Pro and Right Away Quick Strips, which is NOD for Nature's Own Design, has a frequently asked questions list on their website. And I just added that to the chat. They also have some really yeah. cute videos too. Um, but it is, I think, one of the standard recommendations to actually add more supers when you use Formic Pro, especially when you're on the upper end of the temperature, um, because it does tend to go down into the brood nest and it gives the bees um, space. Um, okay, Dan, here's one, another preference one, so we can degree, disagree if we want to. Um, I need to add a third deep to reduce swarming risk. Do I leave them in three deeps to overwinter? Personal preference, um, no problem with bees in three deeps overwintering. Um, you can, you know, it, it, provided they, you know, they fill that third deep with with food and and, and honey. Um, you can rest easy in March and April that your bees are not going to starve, um, save you some mixing up syrup this fall, next spring, potentially. Um, so nothing wrong with wintering bees in three deeps. The Minnesota lab teaches that for bees in northern climates. Um, so it, it's it's kind of trade-offs. You could put that third deep on, um, you know, and later harvest it as honey. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of up to you. Um, Two deeps is kind of the most common, but lots of people do three deeps and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then on the other end of the spectrum, and I'm happy if someone else wants to go, but I can field this one, is someone says they have some five frame hives and what should they leave them for the winter? So um, I happily overwinter some in three deeps, some in two deeps, some in a single deep and some in five frame nukes. Um, one kind of rule of thumb, which I've never heard anybody actually test, but it's a thing that people say is you kind of want to have a frame of food for every frame of bees in there. And so with the small colonies, you you need way less food um, because you have way fewer bees in there. Um, I can see Dan doing kind of like, yeah, that probably sounds right. That's about the level of like certainty I have behind that adage too. Um, but they just need much less. Um, the only thing that is hard about them, or maybe not the only thing, but one of the things that's hard about with these smaller colonies is they also bring in less food. So even when we have, you know, a good goldenrod flow or something like that, you just don't have as many foragers. So when I'm overwintering smaller colonies, if they're not doing a really good job taking food in and putting it away, I'll often, you know, Robin Hood and take some a full frame of capped brood from another hive and just stick it in there. Um, but a, a full frame of honey, or sorry, a full frame of honey from another hive and a full frame of honey will make a really big difference in a small colony. Um, all right. Uh, Anna, it says, should we consider treating for Varroa in the next couple of weeks to protect the developing winter bees? Do you wanna talk about your plan or our plan here? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, in order to really protect the winter bees and their development, we want them to develop under low varroa mite pressure and low virus pressure, and that's kind of a season-long strategy. So we normally start the season trying to figure out how we can manage mites so that we're not letting the varroa mite levels spike, um, and then not subsequently letting the virus levels spike. Uh, so we, on campus, we've already, we've treated with Formic Pro once, we plan to treat again soon once we have the right temperature windows. Uh, Dan and I just finished our second round of Formic Pro on our bees. Um, so we're kind of at that time when we're trying to um, really keep mite levels low still so that when the winter bees are developing, there's not a lot of mites in the hive and not a lot of virus pressure. Mm -hmm. I just want uh, to add to, um, so if you are asking questions in the Q&A box, 
there are some questions that we've typed the responses to. So you can find the answered tab and look for them there. Um, all right. And then there is a question about the role that vitelligenin plays in winter bees. And is there anything a beekeeper can do to increase it in um, in winter bees? And if, I'm, a, I'm on a winter bee kick, so I'll feel this. Um, but basically, the telogenins are phosphoproteins that are in winter bees, but they are produced by the fat bodies. So, you know, having the protecting your vitelligenin and protecting the fat bodies are one and the same. And the two things that really promote it is making sure that they have high protein diets while they're being raised, which for us in Michigan, there's usually so much protein in the colony, which is stored pollen and even incoming pollen. Um, in the late fall that it's not usually considered necessary to do supplemental protein feeding, but making sure, like as Dan mentioned, someone's feeding the bees, either Mother Nature or you or their storage. And then um, the other thing is just once you have those beautiful fat bodies made is just protect the heck out of them from Varroa um, would be the two things. All right. The next question I'm very excited about. Um, so there was a parasite found in the brain of a honeybee um, at U of M. And so I do have a video of it. I was texting when I saw your question come in, Clay, I was texting the person who took the video um, to see if I could post it, but um, they're probably doing something better with their evening. So, um, and I don't know what their their plan is, but it, it's, um, there's a researcher at U of M who's looking at some brain um, development. She's a, a postdoc and took a really cool video of what seems to be a worm parasite. Um, it's likely a nematomorpha, which is like people call them like horsehair worms because they commonly do infect insects. Um, but one of the things with bee diseases is that uh, there's just not enough people looking for them. Um, so I think when you start screening lots of different things, so it is, it commonly infects lots of other insects. Um, and we always hear about the most popular ones because they're the ones that, you know, cause lots of disease. But if you just start looking, um, and start screening, you can find all sorts of things. Um, so we can find like amoeba diseases and lots of different, like we talk about varroa mites, but you could find all sorts of other mites on bees too, um, but they don't necessarily cause um, widespread disease. So maybe she'll give us permission and we can post it or she'll have it posted um, online because parasitic worms are always awesome to look at. Um, Jody asks, respecting location, I'm far enough north that I've had um, mornings under 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the past three weeks. My bees are still actively taking one-to-one -one syrup. Do I still continue providing it until they quick, quit using it? Um, Dan, do you want to do that one? Yeah. Um, so, and, and I'm maybe going to make an assumption that you're, you're starting out with a colony. This is a, a new, you know, a, a nuke or a package, whatever you started with the spring. Um, and, and that you're, you know, if you're feeding syrup, it's not a case where you, where they've got um, supers on. If they're taking syrup and you're trying to build a colony, um, it, th there's not really a problem in, in keep, keep giving it to them. Um, again, I, I don't have experience with far northern UP beekeeping to know if that's um, it, it's yeah, it's late July. But if if they're not getting food, usually if there's food on the landscape, that's preferable to syrup. If they were getting an abundance of nectar, um, it, you know, they probably wouldn't be taking the syrup. So if they're taking it, um, you know, I could keep giving it to them and trying to build out that colony to get it to winter winter size and weight. The only time I've ever seen colonies take syrup beyond when they needed it was when the beekeeper was using a lot of like honey be healthy or something that was really, really attractive. So if you had a feeding stimulant, then that might break down. But otherwise, as Dan said, like they won't take it really unless they need it, um, if they can get enough from the outside. Um, so there's a question, do you winter five frame nukes outside? I absolutely do. And I have some really good photos um, for, that I had people send me. They're over wintering um, nuke photos. And um, 
I'm definitely like nothing that I do is my own invention. Um, I've copied lots of other ways that people in the north overwinter nukes, and there's plenty of people that overwinter five frame nukes outside. That being said, we are building an indoor wintering facility at MSU, and I am super excited to try it, overwintering queens and nukes and things like that. Um, but it, it definitely can be done. And I've had really good success, you know, being like 80% survival in, in years um, with five frame nukes outside. And then I see one last question, um, which I think we can probably all respond to. Um, so it says, during the winter months, how often should you check on the hives? And this is coming from the Grand Rapids area. What is your go-to for feeding them? Um, Anna, do you want to go first? Yeah, so ideally we try to set up our bees so that we don't have to do much feeding at all in the winter. So that means that in the fall we're um, feeding sugar syrup, so heavy syrup, um, you know, this is after we pulled our honey supers, or we're making kind of monitoring the nectar flow. Sometimes the bees can bring a lot of goldenrod in, um, but it's it's not dependable. Um, so what really we're hoping for though is that that if you, for example, if you winter your bees in two hot, two deeps, that you want that top box to be almost solid, just full of syrup or nectar or honey, and then set lots of honey in the bottom box as well. Um, so part of it, you can kind of learn to heft the hive and judge the weight, um, but feeding sugar syrup in the fall is better than trying to feed sugar in the winter because the bees are able to store that sugar soap in the comb and access it kind of the same way that they do in honey when they're feeding and in the cluster. Um, but you do need to give them time so that they can store it and dry it out. If we have to feed in the winter, we will. Um, so normally we're checking, you know, I don't know, maybe a, a few times in the winter, more if we're concerned about where they're at, um, but less if we know that they are just really, really heavy with food. And um, more of the checks happen in the spring after they've had some time to consume some of that food. Uh, the way I've done winter feeding is just with, it's called mountain camping, but it's a single sheet of newspaper on top of the top frames. And then we just put dry sugar on top um, and sometimes have a spacer around that to allow for some room to put that dry sugar. Um, but there's lots of other feed that you can give them. That's just kind of an easy one for us. Other, other perspectives? Well, I guess for me, the um, this last year, I've really had to put my money where my mouth is um, in terms of how I overwinter. So I've spent the last two winters up in the UP and was not with my bees down in Jackson County, Michigan, and was not motivated to make the, you know, eight hour winter drive just to go down and feed them. And so the way that I was always preaching was that you put all your effort in to make sure that the bees get really well fed in the fall and then you don't have to emergency feed during the winter. And so the last year um, I, you know, left for the UP in I think October and then came back in March for the spring beekeepers meeting and, you know, had them all set up in the fall and they were perfectly fine. Um, and but I did a lot of them in three deeps, knowing that I wouldn't be able to come back down there. And then it happened to be a really, really mild winter. So they didn't probably go through as much food as they do. Um, but if so, if you know that you set them up really well in the fall, you maybe have to do nothing. And that's like the ideal situation. Um, we'll see if I get it together again this year now that I talked a big game about how awesome I am at it. So I know, Dan, did you want to add anything? Um no, I no, I think it was covered. Um, I will say because there's a question: When do you stop fall feeding? And as as Anna mentioned, you you want to get the weight on and give them enough time to dry it out. So we typically try to wrap up fall feeding by I'd say in late September, early October, um, to give them a you know October can be hit or miss in Michigan, but give them some time to even though we're feeding heavy syrup with maximum sugar to water ratio they've still got to get some moisture out of that um so you know say try try to be done by the start of october for the most part um and then you know say we're, we're generally not digging in them at all after that it's just a it's a hefting and when you say how often do you check the hives checking doesn't always involve opening it can be a lift yep we're good you know just kind of hefting it and saying yep that's not light um 
So don't really do much, you know, mid-October to mid-March, something like that, typically. Um, so then there's a question of like, when would you use fondant or candy boards then? So, yeah, I, I, we, we treat that as kind of the emergency feed. Um, and so, you know, late February, you know, into, into mid March and kind of looking for, there's probably going to be a few day, a day where it's high thirties, 40 degrees and not, you know, big windy. Um, that might be a day when I go out and, and pop a few layers, you know, heft them if it's light, um, look and see something that's light. And also one way you can tell is if the bees are getting light and we, we talked about earlier about how they're, they start down low with honey on top. If they're up, if they're up quite high, that generally means they've eaten their way up into their honey store. So if you pop an inner cover and they're right there, um, that kind of confirms that lightness you're feeling where they don't have a lot of food. So that's absolutely um, fondant or we do the, you know, we tend to use dry sugar because it'll, it'll over a few weeks, it'll suck up some moisture from the hive and kind of become fondant on its own. Um, but we use it as a kind of to bridge them through that late winter until springtime when it's early, when it's warm enough to give them liquid feed is how we use the fondant and dry sugar. Yeah, same. Um, there is a question about what you do with the third deep in the spring and Anna is raising her hand. Go ahead, Anna. I think it's super convenient to go into spring with three deeps because then normally the bottom box is completely empty. It's just drawn comb and the bees aren't occupying it. So you can put that box on top of the other two boxes and give them room to move up in the spring. And it's also just really nice for doing splits because you have lots of comb and resources and you can sometimes split more than once. You can make nukes. So I think it's convenient having three deeps in the spring the hard part about three deeps is that when you're doing it all through the beekeeping season, that top third deep is normally really heavy with honey um, or the alternative, you know, the equal number of medium boxes. That's a lot of lifting. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I only started doing the three deeps when I knew I was going to be gone the whole winter. But one of the benefits, and it is like the Minnesota version does recommend it. But one of the benefits I found was that in the spring, all your frames were already in the yard. Um, so I had to bring much less equipment out. The other thing is that they were very clearly in like the top two boxes and the bottom one was often empty. But for us in Michigan, in a lot of places, that bottom one is filled with pollen. And so it made my decision making of which frames to call very easy because I could keep them basically in those top two boxes. And then if when I was doing my 10% or 20% removals, it was always coming out of those um, bottom boxes because I could get rid of the frame um, in there. Um, Roy does ask, so he's going to try overwintering indoors. I would definitely like to hear about that. Um, and they say they look forward to seeing more on this. Will you have the research published somewhere? So um, I'm going to put in the chat Project APSM probably has the best resources this on this right now. I have them um, ready so, to go, Megan. If you're oh, good. Okay, I have the. So I don't have the um, webinar up, but I okay. loaded the indoor storage guide. Um, but they also did do a webinar that I found incredibly useful on that. Um, and so they have tons of really good resources. I mean, on lots of things too, but by far the best for indoor wintering. Where we are at with it is um, our facility is, we're hoping to have like four small facilities so we can do experiments and we have one almost done. Um, so we're a ways away from being able to provide great recommendations, um, but that is the goal. The first research project we're doing is being led by Gloria Grandy Hoffman, who's at the um, ARS, the research service lab down in Tucson. Um, so she would be the one in charge of putting those out. And really what we're looking at there is like when fat bees get started and looking at, um, or when winter bees um, get started. So it's it's part of a broader thing, but I think because of Project APSM's resources, there's quite a bit of practical stuff that's available, but I'm definitely interested in hearing other people's experiences as well. Um, Mari asks, what is three deeps equals in mediums? It's Damn. Oh, sorry. <laughs> about five mediums, more or less. Yeah, as I say, between four and five. Um, 
in there so which is a pretty high high amount um charles asks do you have an entrance on every box so that's probably an observation about some of the photos um so the minnesota lab which is where i learned to keep bees in northern climates has a system where you put these drill these auger holes underneath the handles in each box and that's just kind of how they do things it's we at MSU we keep boxes that don't have holes. I don't notice a difference, but because that's how I learned, all of our boxes have holes. Yeah, and I I've started to put holes into my um, deep boxes, and then but I do make them where they're wine cork size, um, so that I can close them up in the winter time if I want to. And I have a neighbor that drinks wine, lots of it for me and drops off wine corks. So I can close up like hundreds of boxes if I need to. Um, and there is a last question that's pretty in depth about fat bias. I think I'm gonna email you an article, um, Tony, instead of getting into it because, so th the one thing about fat bodies and winter bees um, that I can feel really certain about is that um, we do not know enough about when fat bodies develop and the conditions to really promote winter bees. Um, so there are a couple people looking at when bees shut down. The problem is that there's huge genetic differences and there's differences in queen age and there's differences in hive situations and there's differences in what's coming in from the environment. Um, so I think it's something that you know, warrants lots more study and is very important. Um, and then a final question about uses and benefits of using sensing tools for your hives. Is there a future benefit to their tools? Um, I see a couple of nods. I think it is a very exciting time for technology in beehives. Um, there is nothing new that has come out that I feel very strongly is essential. However, I'm very excited that there are so many people with technology backgrounds taking an interest in bees. And I think especially as things are moving so quickly, there could be some really, really cool things. Um, so we we are going to use scales to look at, you know, comparing indoor wintering to outdoor wintering in terms of food usage. Um, but that's kind of the the only monitoring that we're going to do. So I don't know if Anna or Dan, you want to talk about if there's any cool technology you're excited about. I, I think the way that was, I, I think in the future there will be things, but yeah, similar to Megan, there, there's, I haven't seen any game changing things yet. There's a lot of stuff that makes cool promises and is, is potentially doing things, but right now it's largely potential. It's good ideas. It's the actual implementation that um you know there's a lot of work to be done there yeah so i think that's it for the all of the questions um i think that having them um or making sure that you know that you can ask us questions at any time through the ask extension button and then we look forward to talking with you all and hearing more from you uh next month thanks everyone for joining have a great month